uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, for those new friends, uh, I'm Andy Shichentian uh, from the, uh, the founder and the president of the Global Governance Institution, a independent international yes. think tank in China. I know due to the pandemic restrictions this time again, uh, we are meeting virtually for this uh, international uh, expert dialogue on recalibration region tracing. On behalf of the Global Governance Institution, and also as well on behalf of our partner, China Forum of the Center for Strategic and Security Studies of Tsinghua University, uh, thanks all for joining for this event. Uh, just a few words on the top of the event on why we organize this event. As we all know that uh, pandemics are certainly not a new occurrence in human history. Just in the past two decades, we have witnessed the 2002 SARS, 2009 uh, H1N1, mm -hmm. the 2000. For all those pandemics which are still fresh in our minds, there is no doubt that it is very important to trace their origins in the sense that this will uh, help improve global preparedness in the future. However, sadly today, the COVID-19 origin tracing was, has become not only a scientific issue, uh, but maybe more evidently a political one. I'm not a scientist, my background is legal, but as a global citizen, the apparent uh, politicization of COVID-19 uh, origin tracing prompting to ask a few questions uh, to those uh, politicians who politicize it. I think the first question is, is the fruit of the uh, big power competition so sweet that they can sacrifice thousands of people's lives, which could have been saved if the urgent, urgently needed international cooperation are not hurdled by those competition. Is the interest of big powers so important that they can trample the overall interest of international community to such an extent that the mankind is, look, is losing huge ground in the struggle against pandemic. It's simply because the big powers dominate the agenda setting that is beneficial only to their own countries. And it's a, it's a conscience of big powers so cheap, they can sell it easily and conveniently to purchase misinformation. I mean misinformation that caused huge waste of resources and deviated, deflected origin tracing of COVID-19 from a correct tract of science. We have, we have heard so many lies of those uh, politicians. So today, let's listen to the scientists. Let's put this critical scientific task back in the science, in the hands of scientists. Let's keep our shared identity as global citizens and forget about our national or ideological identities and let's unite instead of compete. So our global government institution, one of the fundamental, fundamental value is to, to rely on subject matter experts to promote global governance. And today this event is aimed to raise public awareness, penetrate lies and misinformation, and finally, re-collaborate the tracing of origins of COVID-19 so as to save mankind from future pandemics. To achieve this mission, today we are joined by a group of great scientists and scholars to help us get back to the right track of fighting against pandemic. Without further delay, uh, let me give the floor to my co-host, Madame Liu Xin, who is a China Forum expert and, and well, as well a renowned uh, CGT host and journalist. Uh, she will introduce the speakers and moderate the discussions. Uh, Liu Xin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Shi Cheng. Um, I have to clarify, I'm, I have no medical or science background, but I'm here as someone who is extremely interested in this subject from a journalistic point of view. Uh, as we all know, this subject has been in the news for so long. And uh, somehow what you hear from the scientific community and what you hear from the media 
uh, have been very different. And that is why I'm extremely curious to find out exactly what scientists have to say when they don't have the limitation of you know having to give a few seconds of sound bites that is why we i'm very interested and very pleased to be able to moderate this panel on the uh, um, how to avoid politicization how to let science prevail in this very important work of tracing the origins of COVID 19. i think it is um, um, almost um, useless unnecessary I would say to introduce the background of this whole thing, but as we are going live in China and abroad, I think it is necessary to remind people of the few, of the uh, few key points or um, um, dates, let's say, as to how we have come this far and what are the important questions we have to try to answer going forward. So the whole idea of trying to look for the origins of uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, is to help people better understand exactly how the pandemic developed, how it emerged, and in order to help pre improve the global preparedness so that in the future, when we are faced with another possible pandemic of uh, uh, a virus that could be very infectious and very deadly, we have a better response, hopefully collectively. So such work has been carried out in the past with the, um, the help and the dedication of scientists, but mostly, mostly away from the public spotlight. You know, pe people spend years in the fields or in the lab away from public spotlight, and they are able to uh, make progress and even breakthrough in their work. And yet the tracing of the origins of uh, COVID-19 has been particularly um, con contentious and has actually become a political debate somehow. The whole idea of uh, the idea of a lab leak hypothesis was uh, first um, amplified, I would say, by former US President Donald Trump in April last year, and uh, also by his uh, former Secretary of State. Of course, they talked about having seen credible evidence, but nobody has ever seen, and they were not able to table any evidence so far, and over a year has passed. Now, since the first half of 2021 this year, uh, much more discussion has been directed to this hypothesis, um, Although at the same time, very important work has been done in tracing the origins of COVID-19. We all know that in January and February of this year, a joint mission from China and the World Health Organization conducted very important studies in the city of Wuhan for four weeks. And they came up with a joint report, which looks at four possible pathways, how the virus um, went from its origin to the human population. And they characterized the, the hypothesis of lab leak as being extremely unlikely. And the more likely option being the virus emerged from nature and uh, jumped from at a certain point from nature via an intermediate host onto human beings. So that is uh, recommended by uh, all, the, all the scientists who have participated in that study to be the focus of the future study. And yet, when the conclude or when the recommenda recommendations came out, a lot of uh, uh, different voices, different noise came out from uh, different sectors all around the world. Uh, some some people calling this report, um, you know, made under political pressure, or that this hypothesis has not been the lab leak hypothesis has not been given, been given adequate consideration. Citing, for instance, the number of pages dedicated to this hypothesis in the 120-page report by China and WTO. So, um, if you read the uh, international media stories, you also get the impression that somehow the scientific community seem also be divided over which option is more likely. Um, you have some kind of an open letter signed by over a dozen scientists that's published by the Science Magazine, for instance, of scientists arguing that both um, the lab leak hypothesis and natural origin hypothesis are equally viable and should be given equal you know, emphasis in the investigation going further. Whereas if you talk to some other scientists, as I have talked to uh, one of the scientists uh, who's uh, in the panel today, um, the idea is that it's extremely, extremely unlikely that such a virus, that the SARS-CoV-2 could have emerged from a lab either by human 
uh, manipulation or by event of an accident. So exactly what is the, um, the consensus? What is the more um, scientific way of looking at this? What are scientists who have dedicated their lives into the subject have to say about this instead of journalists or uh, politicians? That's exactly why we're looking at this uh, in this international experts dialogue. Uh, we have prepared four main framing questions First of all, how should SARS-CoV-2 origins tracing work be carried out in terms of relevant provisions on the International Health Regulation, IHR, or the relevant WHO Charter and World Health Assembly resolutions, as well as international norms? Secondly, how to best conduct scientifically rigorous studies and avoid politicization of COVID-19 origins tracing. What has been the biggest stumbling block? How to avoid or at least minimize the impact of misinformation or disinformation? Third, how to balance origins tracing work with the ongoing fight against COVID-19, which continues to, pro to pose even increasing global public health um, challenges as we are seeing at this moment as a result of the Delta variant. Should there be a priority? Um, Fourth, how to avoid distracting from the most urgent scientific tasks and to promote the effectiveness of international cooperation and collaboration for COVID-19 origins tracing. What has been the biggest lesson or lessons learned so far? So our, our panel of guests will speak from their perspective, but more or less within the framework of these questions, I hope. Um, without much ado, I have spoken a lot, without much ado, let's introduce our panel of speakers and I'll introduce them as we go along. By the way, we were going to have eight scientists altogether, including four from China and four from uh, abroad. Unfortunately, one of the Chinese guests became unavailable last minute. So Professor Xu Lei from Tsinghua University will not be speaking. So we have three Chinese scientists and four scientists from um, Germany, from the UK, from the United States, and from Spain. So indeed, I have been looking forward to such an occasion. Let's try to get down to science, let's say. And it is my great honor to introduce our first panel speaker. He is academician Professor Wu Chong Yi. He is a renowned scientist in evolutionary biology and genetics, and the Yanzi River Scholar Chair Professor at Sun Yat-sen University in Southern China. Now, he was born in Taiwan in 1954, and he graduated from Tonghai University in Taiwan with a bachelor's degree in biology in 1976. In 1982, he graduated from the University of British Columbia in Canada with a doctorate in genetics. Professor Wu was elected an academician of the Academia Sinica in Taiwan in 2004. Currently, he's a Yangtze River Scholar and the chair professor at Tsai Yat-sen University and also a researcher at the Beijing Institute of Genomics of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He was also the chair professor of the Department of Ecology and, and Evolution of Chicago University. So, Professor Wu Chong Yi, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, th thank you for the invitation. I, I, I think I should say that I spent the most, the great part of, bulk of my career at the University of Chicago. I, I've been a professor at the University of Chicago for 30 years, 29 actually. Uh, so what, what I want to do, everybody say that, that of course we all understand the, the question of origin is, is a scientific question, but I want to emphasize the evolutionary perspective. I want, I, I'm an evolution biologist. I, work, I, I have worked on the origin of flies of dogs and rice. Uh, simply because I, I, I use the evolutionary principles and, and I think the virus is no different. So in the past, if we deal with something like the origin of SARS-CoV-2, we only have to demonstrate that natural process can reasonably lead to a product like that. But in this uh, climate, we also have to go a step further and say that, that the natural evolution is the only possible way for such a thing um, to come about. And, and so this is really like the, the, we talk about the origin of universe that, that people who have no background in astrophysics or physics in general could uh, talk at length about the origin of the universe. We would find it very strange, but people who, doesn't have, who do not have anything, uh, any background in evolution biology can, can, can speak about, about the origin of SARS-CoV-2. 
So, so a main question is not to show that natural process can lead to it, but actually to show that that's the only way to lead to it. And, and so the, the, the main argument is that this SARS-CoV-2 is extremely well adapted to human. And for something to become so adapted to human condition, uh, it has to be a long and, 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 and tedious process. For one thing that the product has to be tested in human populations. It's just like if you try to release a driverless car to the society, you cannot expect that your first uh, rollout, the car would, 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 would perform wonderfully. It has to be, it has to deal with also the road condition anticipated or unanticipated. And it, you really work out the box and maybe go through, go through a long process. The, 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 the driver of this car can finally be adapted to the human societies. And the virus, if we look at it from conceptual conceptual point of view, that, that it's unlikely that you can grab a virus in a sort of lab leak hypothesis, bring back to the lab and maybe tinker with the, the, with the one or two mutations. And then uh, it would become a, 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 such a pathogen. It's very unlikely. Let me give you the example. We have been looking at the, 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 the sort of now very famous Delta strain. And we look at it, it actually has 31 mutations. Now, remember Delta strain replaced the alpha strain. Uh, it's a simple uh, competition, it just has to do better. But for a virus, the origin of SARS-CoV-2 to be uh, from adaptation to an animal host, to human, I would say that 30 mutation would be a very, very low minimum. It, it, probably would require at least two, three times that number. So the, the virus has to go through a very long process to become so extremely well adapted to human, human conditions. So the first thing I want to say is that it's inconceivable, either in, 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 a, in a lab synthesis or to take a virus from nature, from any animals, and release it into human population and, and, and presto and expected it to, to, to sort of burn through human population. I consider that, that extremely unlikely. And so what we have to do, there are two things that, that the first thing is that we have to define the conditions. Uh, we invoke the blind watchmaker argument that we, we published a paper, a group of, of two, uh, 20s, or so evolution biologists, including seven or eight of the mo most prominent one in China, that, that we define using the blind watchmaker argument to define the conditions under which that such a virus might, might emerge. And it in, in involved the, the, uh, uh, a large population of, of animal host and, and a low density of human population, free contact, a frequent contact and so on. And her immunity, so step by step it evolved. So, so I think this is important. I think in, in the last conversation with, with, with Madame Liu, I actually say that whoever wants to pursue the question of the origin has to propose a model. You cannot say, just say origin. And you want to, if someone wants to search for the origin, someone needs to propose a model. It's just like you want to catch a crime suspect. You at least have to have some ideas about the general profile of the suspect. You cannot just say suspect. Uh, you, you have to, and, and we, we actually defined it. Maybe you, you don't like this model and say, well, I don't think so. But you, everybody has to propose a model, what, what it looks like, what, what conditions under which this can emerge. And as far as I know, we, we are the only one who proposed an explicit model, right or wrong, we don't know. But, but if you don't have a model, you cannot start any search, it's meaningless. And I want to make another point that the new data, new, new, uh, new evidence has, has emerged and it's somewhat premature to say it now that these new data will probably change drastically how we see this. For example, I mean, there are many not very credible reports about detect detection of, of SARS-CoV-2 in much earlier samples. 
But recently, they are one or two really believable reports that the variant has existed. And, and this is not the occasion un unless we have two hours uh, for me to go through the evidence. Uh, I just want to say people should not be so confident about what uh, the origin is. I mean, no scientist, I mean, a politician can be very sure about what, what, what the, the origin will be, but scientists should be more circumspect about that. So that's the first part. I, I, I think that's my view, evolution biology view about the origin of, of SARS-CoV-2. So I want to say something very quickly about the path forward. I, I think the, the, the lab leak hypothesis uh, is such a low probability event for us to spend so much time, energy, on this origin, on this low probability events, it, we, are, we look like a bunch of school, school kids uh, fighting in the playground. We are not trying to solve anything. We just, you punch me in the nose, I'll kick you in the butt. That's sort of, sort of uh, 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 exchanges. It, it's a complete waste of time. The, the COVID-19 is flaring up again. And we seem to, and Delta strain really, is a fairly dangerous strain. I, I think we should concentrate our effort. For example, the vaccination doesn't seem to be doing what we thought it could do. The social distancing has reached, uh, has well, has been tested and treatment has been neglected. Uh, so we need to define a lot of things so we can, we can resolve this problem. And, and so I would say that, let's face it, origin is not an urgent problem. If we solve the, we, we, we eradicate uh, uh, COVID-19, then we have decades to work out what the, or where the origin is and who should be responsible and, and so on for that sort of thing. But this is not the time to, 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 to waste our energy, divert our attention to something of such a low probability like, really like kids fighting that we're not trying to solve anything. We just want to feel good. So I, I, I think that that's an important point. I, even I have been interviewed several times and, and it's always on this very low probability events. And I have to say that again, that is, we, we should not spend so much time on lab leak. It's just not a respectable hypothesis. And I, I think I, I, I'd say uh, what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Academician Wu. Thank you. I hope uh, we are able to focus more on the real science during this panel. However, we have to clear the noises out of the way, uh, hopefully. Let me introduce our next speaker, Professor Shi Weifeng. He's Professor of Virology and Director of Shandong Key Laboratory of Etiology and Epidemiology of uh, Emerging Infectious Disease of China. Now he obtained his uh, PhD in Biological Information from the National University of Ireland in June 2012 and was promoted to Professor in April 2014 and the Director of the Epidemiology Laboratory of Emerging Diseases in Shandong Province in 2008. 15. He's also guest associate editor for the Journal of Frontiers in Microbiology and has published numerous articles in the fields of um, microbiology, virology, and prevention of infectious diseases. Since 2016, he has been engaged in scientific research studying the key molecules of emergencies and emerging diseases, including influenza A virus and Ebola. Professor Shi, the floor is yours. Hey. Hello, everyone. Thank you for ha having me here. And uh, my name is Wei Feng Shi, and uh, I'm from Shandong First Medical University. My group was involved in the discovery of the cultive agent of COVID-19, and uh, we have uh, performing genomic surveillance of this virus in China and uh, across the world. In fact, uh, since the first report of uh, SARS-2, in December 2019 in Wuhan, China, there has been intense uh, interest in understanding how this virus emerged in the human population. Re recent uh, debate has uh, coalesced around the two uh, competing ideas. Um, a lab leak 
scenario and uh, zoonotic emergence. Today, I would like to share the scientific evidence that may help uh, clarify the origin of this virus. My first point is that SARS-2 is from nature, is the consensus of global scientific community. Uh, shortly after the identification of this virus, uh, several world-known scientists analyzed the genomes of this virus and uh, found that it had two unique genetic characterizations. First, there are six amino acid positions which are extremely important for the attachment of uh, SARS and SARS-2 to the human ACE2 receptor. Uh, please remember these six positions because I will mention them later. Uh, however, uh, SARS-2 is different from SARS in uh, at five of these six positions. In particular, SARS-2 has a higher binding efficiency to the human ACE2 receptor than SARS. Uh, second, there's a 12 nucleotide insertion at the cleavage site of the spike gene of SARS-2. Uh, this encoded four amino acids, PRI. PRI can be recognized by uh, protease theory. Uh, some scientists believe that this insertion could potentially enhance the uh, pathogenesis of SARS-2. Uh, however, from the very beginning of the pandemic, there has been a conspiracy theory. Uh, some politicians in Western countries believe in this hypothesis. They believe in, they believe that the two unique genetic char characterizations of SARS-2 are genetically manipulated. However, different groups subsequently reported uh, several coronaviruses from pangolins. In particular, some of pangolin derived coronaviruses share the same amino acids as those six important positions as such coronavirus 2. It should be noted that these wild pangolins were smuggled from Southeast Asia and were caught at the customer in 2019. In addition, two bat coronaviruses from Cambodia share five of the six amino acid residues. This evidence suggests that there are coronaviruses from wild pangolins and bats that are able to bind to human ACE2 receptor with very high efficiency. At the same time, uh, from a bat sample collected uh, uh, from Yunnan in May 2019, we identified a novel coronavirus. This, uh, this virus had a similar uh, Yindel uh, event at the cleavage site of the spike gene. Uh, subsequently, a bad coronavirus from Thailand was also found to possess similar in their pattern. So although their insertion patterns are not exactly the same as such coronavirus 2, it suggests that such in their events can happen in nature. Uh, just, just a short summary. So the so-called unique genetic characterizations of such coronavirus 2 have been found in coronaviruses from wild animals. Last month, uh, 21 top virologists working on virus evolution uh, published online a critical review. They contend that uh, there's a substantial body of scientific evidence supporting a zoonotic origin of such coronavirus 2. Notably, these top of virologists are from seven countries, such as Australia, the USA, and the UK. These authors belong to 22 different uh, affiliations. Therefore, 
SARS-2 is from nature, it is a consensus of global scientific community. This is my first point. The second point I would like to share is that there's no scientific evidence of lab leak. We also read through the reports supporting the lab leak hypothesis. However, most of them are preprints and are not peer reviewed. So they are not uh, reliable. Only very few of them, only very few of them are formally published. However, nine of them is a research article and the nine of them uh, they provide scientific evidence to support their statement. Therefore, there's no evidence to support the lab leak hypothesis. While the possibility of a laboratory accident cannot be entirely dismissed, it may be near impossible to falsify. In July, a correspondence was published in the Lancet Journal the, the authors are a group of top vi virologists. They said that science, rather than speculation, is essential to de determine how this virus reached humans. So the last point I would share is that it is estimated that uh, there, there would be more than half a million undiscovered viruses in nature that are able to infect the mammals and even humans because these viruses are everywhere on the earth. We believe that viruses are animals, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, so we believe that viruses are enemies of all human beings and the enemies of all countries. However, unfortunately, the number of viruses that scientists have have known it's just about 10,000, only with a few hundred viruses that, that can infect humans. So it just represents a very tiny proportion when compared to the estimated number of viruses. So therefore, we really need international scientific uh, collaboration and uh, cooperation to prevent and control emerging infectious disease. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Shi. I understand, although I'm not a science major, but I understood that uh, what you were saying, you were giving evidence that uh, some of the features in the SARS-CoV-2, although alleged to have been the result of uh, lab man manipulation, have actually been found in wild animals as well. Yes. And some, of the, some of the wild animals were actually found in areas outside of China, in Southeast Asia, for instance, so uh, maybe more attention should be given in that direction. Thank you very much, Professor Shi. Next, let me go to Professor Peter Foster from uh, Cambridge, UK. Um, I hope you can hear us now. Would you make a sign that you can hear me? Okay, you are still muted, but uh, I hope you will be unmuted in just a moment. But I would like to welcome you and uh, give uh, our audience is a, a brief introduction of our next uh, guest who is fellow of the McDonald Institute for Archaeological Archeologic, Research of the University of Cambridge, UK. Now, Professor Peter Foster's research concerns the molecular population genetics of humans. He was born in 1967. He studied chemistry at the universities of Kiel and Hamburg. He specialized in genetics at the Heinrich Peter Institute of Virology and Immunology in Hamburg. And he received his PhD in biology in 1997 after postdoctoral research at the Institute of Legal Medicine in Münster until 1999. He was appointed research fellow at the McDonald Institute for archeological research in Cambridge until 2006. In the same period, he became a founding member of uh, the interdisciplinary Junger Academy in Berlin. 
From 2006 to 2009, he was a university senior lecturer in forensics and life sciences. He's currently director of research at the Institute for Forensic Genetics in Münster, Germany. He's also fellow of the McDonald Institute, as I said, and he's also an editor of the International Journal of Legal Medicine. So Professor Forster, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Let me first clarify, my research was conducted at Cambridge University, but I'm speaking in a private capacity. Of course. Okay. Okay. So thank you for the invitation to speak at this video conference. It's a pleasure. So my name is uh, Peter Forster and my teams in Germany and in Cambridge have since 1995 used a new type of genetic analysis method to trace and to date in absolute time the prehistoric human colonization of the world from an African origin in the past 60,000 years. So we succeeded in this by introducing a novel mathematical method, which we call a media network method. And this successfully clarified relationships between genomes and for the first time. So in January 2020, when I first heard of the new coronavirus, I immediately realized we could trace the origin and development of the coronavirus using the same media network methods as in anthropology. So in our April 2020 paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the USA, we identified the ancestral human coronavirus type by comparison with bat coronaviruses. We named this original human virus type A, and we also described a predominant descendant type, which we called B. Now, unbeknown to us, a Chinese research team at Peking University had already published a very similar result in March 2020, so one month before. And this is very good because it means an independent European team and an independent Chinese research team have reached the same conclusion. So that is very satisfactory in science. So using this analysis, we distinguished three levels of origin of the virus. At the earliest level is the transmission of the coronavirus from animal to human. As we've heard in the previous speakers, the closest known bat coronavirus differs little from the current human coronavirus by only 4% of the genome. And that corresponds to a maximum of 50 years of separation according to the mutation rate we measured. Now these 50 years is only a maximum estimate because we probably have not yet found the most closely related bat population as the previous speaker indicated. Furthermore, the bats and the first patients live in the same geographical region so the animal-human transmission must have happened quite recently, in my view, possibly as recently as 2019. And the exact transmission mechanism is under investigation by Chinese researchers for some years, in fact. So in 2015, the team of Xi Zhengli and colleagues surveyed villagers in Yunnan province who were living near bat caves caves full of bats, and uh, uh, this team found that 3% of these villages had antibodies against bat coronaviruses, and this evidently was occurring through natural transmission from animal to human. The second level concerns the geographical origin and spread of the symptomatic virus within China. So what I did uh, and also for this talk, I examined available genome sequences and I also examined clinical histories of, the, of early patients. Now I'll show you a first map, a slide with a share screen function. I hope to see um, a map which says SARS-CoV-2 occurrence of ancestral A and derived B types from uh, December 2019 until mid-January 2020. Can you see this? Yes. Good. All right. So in this map, um, this shows where the original ancestral A types and the derived B types 
were detected in patients until mid-January 2020. So the patient numbers are very low at this early stage. The black pie slices are the, early a, the original A-type and the white uh, portions are the derived younger B-types. So although we have very few samples at this very early stage until mid-January 2020, so only 34 B-types and seven A-types, it is clear that the A-types are very rare in Wuhan and in Hubei province. Only one in 29 patients have the original A-type. In contrast, there are more A-types detected in southern China. So this makes Wuhan a less likely source. Now in the next map, this is one week later. The sample sizes are still very small. So now we have 61 B types and 22 original A types. But it is clear that the A and B types in this week later are spreading in parallel across China. Remember that Wuhan had mainly B types up to the previous week. And this suggests that Wuhan is not the major source of the epidemic. If Wuhan had been the source, we would have expected a spread of only or mainly B types. But instead, what we see here is a mix of black and white spreading, a mix of A and B types spreading. So this is not easily explained by a spread from Wuhan. Right, so we can stop the share screen. Yeah. Um, at, the at the third level, we can ask where the current global variants come from. And these global variants, we all know, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. In our original network analysis in April 2020, we had noticed that B types, including a so-called B1 type, were behaving aberrantly. So you can see that in the statistical analysis, this B1 type is behaving differently. And that is predictive of the rapid spread of B1 in 2020 from Asia to Europe and then worldwide. Several months later, the Los Alamos National Laboratory in the USA confirmed that this B1 type causes a higher viral load in patients than non-B1 types. Our network analysis can therefore be a valuable tool for guiding clinical research. So you can see at an early stage statistically that a virus is behaving or a variant is behaving differently. So to summarize, our work provides preliminary evidence that first, the animal human transmission occurred relatively recently and possibly as recently as 2019. Secondly, the pattern of spread of the ancestral A and descendant B types argues against a Wuhan or Hubei origin, whereas more ancestral types were detected in southern China. Thirdly, a single aberrant Asian B1 ancestor gave rise to the current global variants Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and Delta. So I thank you for your attention. And if you are interested in a fuller account of our research, see the website of the Cambridge Philosophical Society, where I have a longer lecture on the subject. Thank you very much, Professor Foster. Uh, I think you have tried your best and very effectively to illustrate some very sophisticated scientific work. Um, without a scientific background, I seem to have been able to understand you, <laughs> understood you, and your summary has been uh, clear enough. Um, very interesting study, very interesting study, and I'll open the floor later for, discuss, for discussion on these, I'm sure. Uh, Next, let me introduce our next speaker, Professor Jonathan Stoyer. He's a group leader of the Retrovirus Host Interactions Laboratory of the Francis Crick Institute. Uh, I've heard you are a real cool head, so I'm really <laughs> looking forward to your presentation. So 
But a brief uh, bio here, Jonathan was born in Oxford, but studied a BA degree in natural sciences at the University of Cambridge. He then worked as a technician for five years in Basel, Switzerland, before embarking on research supervised by Christopher, Christoph Moroni, leading to a PhD from the University of Basel. Next, he joined John Coffin's lab in Boston, USA, spending seven years as a research associate before returning to the UK with an appointment at the MRC's National Institute for Medical Research. Since 2015, he has been a senior group leader at the Francis Crick Institute. He was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 2017. So Professor Stoyer, you have the mic. Thank you. Good afternoon from London. Uh, my name is Jonathan Stoy. I'm a virologist in Francis, at the Francis Crick Institute. And like Peter before me, I'm speaking on my personal behalf and not on the behalf of the Institute. Why am I here today? I strongly believe we need to uncover the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic, not to pass judgment on previous events, but rather to learn for the future and to put in place improved mechanisms for coronavirus surveillance and for recognizing and responding to new disease. I'm not a coronavirus specialist, so I might ask what qualifies me to offer an opinion on this subject. I would co counter that I have considerable experience in working with retroviruses, and for many years have studied the replication, recombination, and cross-species transmission of this group of viruses, as well as host defenses to infection. And I believe this experience is of direct relevance to understanding such processes for other viruses. So what do the precedents for other viruses tell us about the origins of SARS-CoV-2? Well, over the last 50 years or so, there have been numerous examples of cross-species transmission of infectious agents from one species to another, leading to new diseases in humans. And AIDS is perhaps the outstanding example of that. Given the frequency at which these novel diseases emerge, it seems highly likely that there will be a continuous and perhaps increasing flood of viruses crossing species barriers and posing new threats. Sometimes viruses appear to move essentially unchanged from one species to another, Sometimes a variety of genetic changes occur to allow adaptation of the novel host. One important lesson we learned from the study of these diseases is that establishing animal origins can take an awful long time. For example, it took nearly 15 years to show that HIV-1 came from chimpanzees. We currently recognize seven human coronaviruses, including SARS-2. Five of these viruses seem likely to originate from different species of bats, the other two from rodents. I would also add that there are multiple accounts of animal to human spillover events, including a recent report of an alpha coronavirus of dog origin in a patient with pneumonia. These have not apparently resulted in widespread human to human transmission, but have the potential to do so. And these observations underscore that public health threat of coronaviruses. In trying to learn about the origin of SARS-2, it's helpful to examine more closely the relationship between bat coronaviruses, coronaviruses and SARS-1. A couple of facts are pertinent. First, a wide variety of different coronaviruses have been identified in bats, but none is completely identical to SARS-1 in sequence over its entire length. Rather, it seems to be a mosaic formed between different viruses native to horseshoe bats. Second, such a recombinant virus seems to be present in civets. Together, they imply an origin for SARS-1 involving recombination between different bat viruses, followed by transfer to civets and subsequent transmission to humans. It seems reasonable to suppose that SARS-2 was formed in the same way. But these same studies also point to difficulties in establishing a definitive origin for SARS-2. First, there appears to be an endless variety of bat coronaviruses, any of which might contribute to the generation of SARS-2, to say nothing of potential future threats, such as a possible SARS-3 virus. Second would be the need to identify a host that, must, that might act as an intermediate between bat and human, serving both to allow further adaptation of bat recombinant, as well as transfer of the virus from, from the the source of its original source into humans. So what do we really know about the origin of SARS-2? I think everyone agrees that the virus first showed widespread person-to-person -person transmission 
in Wuhan and China at the end of 2019. Otherwise, there's considerable uncertainty about its origins. The closest natural variant identified shows more than 3% sequence divergence, corresponding to at least 900 nucleotide differences, and was isolated from a sample taken from a bat more than 1,000 kilometers from Wuhan. So how did the virus change and how did it travel? The most straightforward hypothesis is the virus was formed by recombination between two or more so far unidentified viruses, probably in a horseshoe bat. This virus then infected a human or other animal and transited to Wuhan before sustained transmission started. The problem here is that neither original nor intermediate host has yet been defined. I do not find it surprising given the scale of the problem, but others have been quick to advance alternative theories. These theories are hard to disprove, but simply denying their truth merely serves to harden positions and poisons relationships between different organizations and countries. It is indisputable that there are one or more labs in Wuhan working with bat coronaviruses or bat parasites, and in at least one case performing gain of function experiments. It's also true that virus escape from supposedly secure labs has occurred on different occasions in several countries. So it does not seem unreasonable to ask the question whether it had occurred in this case. Simply denying this possibility does not help resolve the question. A thorough lab audit conducted in the early stages of the investigation with a group who is experienced in such matters, given the opportunity to examine all the lab records and to have discussions with all staff, might well have solved this problem. I suspect it would still be a benefit. I consider less reasonable, uh, given the sequence of the of SARS-2 virus and other known cor coronaviruses, to advance speculative theories that virus had been purposely manipulated. At the moment, such ideas simply fan the fires of controversy. It has been suggested by some that fully infectious SARS-2 was present in humans prior to December 2019 in other parts of the world, either by spillover from another animal source or perhaps as a result of escape from research laboratories. Transfer to Wuhan might then have occurred via food chains. However, all these theories seem relatively unlikely given the absence of significant outbreaks of COVID-19 disease elsewhere. Notably, most of the scientific evidence put forward for these ideas is weak. In the future, we need to make more, we need to be more robust in drawing conclusions from flawed data. For example, PCR experiments where only one out of three reactions gave a positive signal, or serology that might be explained by cross-reactivity to another coronavirus infection. What can we hope for in the future? My vision, or perhaps you could label it my dream, has two major features. First is a detailed catalogue of viruses with zoonotic potential, accompanied with enhanced surveillance for virus transfer at the animal-human interface. Second, um, systems for more rapid reporting and response to new infections should be developed. Arguably, responses to COVID-19 were too slow from all parties involved. We've learned much from the, from the current pandemic with regard to containment measures. More rapid dissemination of early warnings would facilitate responses, for example, through development of rapid PCR diagnostic tests to future emergencies. But where do we stand now? The report of phase one of the WHO convened study has been published. A number of reasonable suggestions for further studies have been put forward, including searches for more SARS-related viruses or surveys of additional poss possible intermediate hosts. However, little real progress has been made in limiting the scope of the inquiry. And it seems that trust between the various parties has all but evaporated. There seem to be serious differences of opinion between WHO and the Chinese government about areas of investigation deserving attention. Meanwhile, we're also waiting for a report from the US intelligence agencies on their assessment of the competing origin theories, though I don't think we'll learn very much from that. So we're left at something of an impasse. How can we move forward? We need to clarify 
and clearly identify the original source or sources of SARS-2 and how it reached Wuhan. This will require the combined efforts of multiple people coupled with openness and a willingness to accept facts. However, it may not be possible until we restore trust between the various players involved. I do appreciate that this is much more easily said than done, but one thing which might facilitate this work is a better specific understanding of the science involved. A second thing would be the development of detailed hypotheses, as well as very specific criteria to assess these, rather than simply relying on, on mass surveys. For example, reports of serological reactivity must account for the problems of cross-reactivity. And I would like to ask whether it'd be possible to develop immunological assays that would identify reactivity with the unique features of SARS-2, such as the furid cleavage site. Similarly, any suggestions of virus manipulation must be accompanied with precise hypotheses about the starting nature of the virus manipulate, ma manipulated, coupled with details about how and why any changes are accomplished. Eliminating distracting areas of investigation in a way that has not yet been accomplished needs to be an important part of the process because we need to move with speed. I would simply note that it took nearly a year for the WHO visit to Wuhan. The next pandemic may be just around the corner and we need to put such processes in place now. I have one final suggestion. I wonder whether it might be possible to set up a World Coronavirus Center to try to answer some of the questions we're asking. It could be modeled on the World Influenza Center and fall under the umbrella of the WHO, but operate independently. It would also address some of the more general surveillance issues for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Stoye. Um, I think you raised some very important points, some of which has already been clarified by the relevant authorities, for instance, whether gain of function research ever took place in the lab in Wuhan. But you mentioned that I, you know, I just want to, um, you know, to complement uh, the understanding all the information that has been given by the Chinese government. And uh, but you raised some very important points, and uh, I hope to come back to these, and our panelists should come back to these in the discussion that, uh, that are following the presentations. Many thanks to Professor Stoye. Next, let me introduce our next speaker, Eric Fagel-Ding, Senior Fellow at the Federation of American Scientists in Washington, DC. He's also Chief Health Economist for Microclinic International, the US. Now he uh, is a uh, nutritionist and epidemiologist, and he's an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and uh, Brian and Brian and w Women's Hospital and founder and director of the Campaign for Cancer Prevention. His research primarily focuses on obesity and nutritional risk factors for diabetes, heart disease and cancer, as well as translation of research for population prevention and global health. After completing his undergraduate degree at the uh, Johns Hopkins University with honors in public health, and election to Phi Beta Kappa, he um, earned his due doctorate in epidemiology and doctorate in nutrition at the age of 23 from Harvard University. He was the youngest uh, graduate from his doctoral programs at Harvard. Eric has taught and lectured in more than a dozen graduate and undergraduate courses for which he received the Derek Bock Distinction in Teaching Award from Harvard College. Eric, you have the mic, please. Yes, thank you so much for having me. And I think in many ways, this is a very multidisciplinary pandemic in response. I think in many ways, we have obviously virologists um, and, and variations of evolutionary biologists and immunologists, and of course, specialists like vaccinologists. Um, but I think in certain ways, you know, I, I'm, an, I'm not an infectious disease epidemiologist per se, but my doctorate in epidemiology has taught me one thing that, you know, the, there is a lot of ways you can look at data. You know, I've been teaching systematic reviews um, for many years, and whether it's, I've been whistleblower of many previous things, whether it comes to pharmaceutical uh, industry and hiding uh, clear malfeasance on their part in adverse events. So I've seen 
um, many of these situations with, and also lead poisoning when clearly the data shows a very targeted trend to hide the data, right? Whether it's the lead poisoning in children um, in Flint, whether it's the, you know, the, uh, the drug Vioxx in which they hide clearly the heart attacks that were later revealed that they willfully hid them um, and other renal effects. So these kind of things I've seen before, whenever someone try to hide the data, I think in this uh, SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus situation, there, I don't think there's any willful direction in which they're trying to hide a clearly a guilty thing that someone did. I don't, there, the data does not show that. The data is all over the place. There is wide range of even, um, as you know, the, the, the fecal testing in the wastewater and the wastewater clearly showed that the virus was outside of China and in Europe as early as October, some say September, but October, November, in which they found positive cases who went to the hospital in late October and, and tested positive in early November. And this is in Italy. And they also found wastewater um, in fall of 2019 in France for SARS-CoV-2. And they also found it in blood donation samples of archived blood in the US CDC database of blood donations. And this paper was also published by the, uh, the, the, the specific uh, task force in the CDC that monitors these kind of blood donation samples for infectious diseases. So in many ways, <clears throat> the data is really, really diffuse there is no specific explanation for any of these fall 2018 infections. And as a previous colleague um, pointed out, it, it, the data for an, an A and B variants of SARS-CoV-2 clearly show it was already very diffuse across China um, back then when it was collected in January and in, in late December. So I think this is where you have to use um, a little bit more of logic. If the data is not consistent, you can cherry pick data that shows one specific directional finding. But if you don't find that systematic, and I come from this um, background of systematic reviews in epidemiology of looking at clinical trials in which um, you have, for example, many uh, clinical trials that only just have one heart attacks, one kidney failures, and, but they all, when you flip the coin, they all flip on and fall on one side of the data, clearly showing that the drug was dangerous. You don't have this uh, systematic tendency towards one side. The data is all over the place. And I think the selective reporting of a lot of the data is what creates this narrative. This narrative formation is very easy in epidemiology because you know, there's also the saying correlation is not always causation, but every causation is a correlation. And to know the difference is epidemiology, uh, the study of causal data and causal data patterns in human populations. And that is where I'm really coming down hard. Because I also, um, you know, as a whistleblower back in January that this is going to be a uh, the thermonuclear level bad pandemic, I, I had no agenda, but many early on accused me because of my Chinese born background that, you know, I am a mic piece for a certain, uh, you know, political agenda, which I do not have any political allegiances in that sense. I think what, ha what happens is that people want to believe and people want to blame. And you see that also with Afghanistan right now, that, you know, those who want to blame Biden have a lot to blame him for. Those who want to blame Trump have a lot to blame Trump for. But I think in certain ways, we know that here there's uh, in Afghanistan without getting into details, there's many other reasons, right? And I think the, the, the way that we try to describe it in science and people don't understand science and, and that's the truth. Like for example, the AB variance distribution or some of these other data if you don't have a big scope and you only target your news message or any other propaganda message for one specific angle, like some members of Congress in the US try to do, you get a very, very convincing narrow narrative. And I think as an epidemiologist and policy person who's seen how data can be distorted, 
and seeing how industry fight back whenever they've been accused of this. And, but clearly there is no Purdue Pharma conspiracy to push opioids uh, uh, level kind of conspiracy like there is for this. Purdue Pharma definitely pushed opioids. Merck uh, and clearly try to hide the data on the dangers of their uh, Vioxx drug, but there is no systematic data here. And I think that's as a as an epidemiologist who kind of looks at the totality of data, there is no directionality, and that lacks of directionality, in my sense, is the best evidence that there is no, you know, specific lab origin. Obviously, there's obviously more data to be and work to be done, but I think in the totality, the confusing array of data and inconsistency and unexplained nature of data is the best evidence, right? that probably natural origin is the most likely. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. You have been a frequent guest on my show and it's always very interesting to hear what you have to say. And you made scientific matter very simple and very easy to follow. I think you have made it very clear. No need for me to help summarize for the sake of the audience here. Of course, we hear more from your perspective in the conversation that uh, will follow. And next, let me go to our next speaker, distinguished uh, Professor Luis Juanes from Spain. He's international member of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States. Uh, he is also CSIC Research Professor at the National Center for Biotechnology and Director of the Coronavirus Group of Spain. Um, he has a very long list, so bear with me because <laughs> obviously he has a very distinguished career in science. He has been elected as a new international member of the American National Academy of Science, of course, and this election recognizes his distinguished and continuing achievements in original research. He has been working for more than 35 years on mechanisms of replication, transcription, vir um, virulence, and virus host interaction of coronaviruses. Since January 2020, his group has been working on a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2, applying the scientific knowledge that they already used in previous coronavirus outbreaks. Throughout his career, he has published more than 235 articles in international journals and 50 eight book chapters. He's also a Fogarty visiting fellow at the U.S. National Institute of Health and a visiting scientist at the U.S. National Institute's Center for Cancer Research. He's a professor of virology at the Autonomous University of Madrid and the Pasteur uh, Institute in Paris. He has been appointed senior distinguished virologist by the Spanish Society of Virology, academic of uh, the Royal Academy of Exact Physical and Natural Sciences and academic of the North American Academy of uh, Microbiology. He's also an expert consultant for the NIH and the World Health Organization and has been editor in chief of virus research. So distinguished professor in Juanes, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Let's see how I start and how I end because we have very very little time. So I just want to repeat that I have been working on virology for more than 40 years. I am not young anymore, but the last 35 years I spent on working with coronaviruses. So I have a long time expertise in this area. Unfortunately, I am not an epidemiologist, but I know good ones. So I will dedicate a few words to the publication by some epidemiologist. One of the things we have done along my career on coronaviruses is that our team in Madrid was the first in the world that we made an infectious cDNA clone of a coronavirus. That was in the year 2000, that was published in the PNAS, and since that we could engineer any genome of any coronavirus. We have engineered at this moment, maybe I don't know exactly, but seven, eight different coronavirus genomes. That means that I can be either a terrorist by turning virulent those coronaviruses that are attenuated, or uh, but at, at this time I prefer to make a, a direct a group of people working on vaccine development. This is what we are doing now, preferentially in our laboratory, because we can modify very easily the genome of the different viruses. If I say I am saying that is because 
although we know a lot on reverse genetic systems and we have the ability to modify virus by using genetic engineering, we do not know at all all the things that we know to engineer a virus like this. So uh, SARS coronavirus 2. So although I have been collaborating with Cheng Li Shi from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, I don't think neither Cheng Li, neither us, we could engineer a virus such as uh, SARS coronavirus 2. It does, probably I can say that as well as a uh, another set of, of people because we don't have the knowledge for that. What we know that all previous uh, human coronavirus, they have zoonotic origin, as have the vast majority of human viruses. And I don't know why that should be changed now. In along my, my profession of, as a coronavirologist, any time that a new important coronavirus comes, will always be theories indicating that the has, that virus has been created by American government to defeat communists or the other way around. So uh, I am not surprised now we have the same type of debate because that existed with HIV, with polio, and with many other viruses. The closest known relatives of both SARS coronavirus 1 in SARS coronavirus 2, are viruses from bats in Yunnan. For both SARS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus 2, there is a considerable geographic gap between Yunnan and the location of the first human cases. Uh, I will refer in my short presentation to one paper, mostly, because as I said, I, we are good experts in biology, reverse genetic systems, but we are not uh, epidemiologists. And I strongly recommend to everyone, I think most of you already read the paper recently published two weeks ago by Edward Holmes. It's a fantastic paper he has submitted to Cell. And I don't think very few people can put together all the science that this guy has put in the paper. And I can end my presentation in two seconds just by saying that I, I follow and I support any conclusions that they get in the paper. The main conclusion is that most likely today, there is much, much more evidence for the animal origin of the virus than for the lab origin of the virus. Uh, uh, Professor Holmes, he repeats that on his paper, but he has the time to provide the scientific evidence for that. So well, as I know, I will be forgetting many things. Please read this paper because like the papers from other epidemiologists, uh, they have a lot of serious information. I also was the co-signer of the two letters that have been published in the Lancet this uh, fantastic uh, journal. In these two letters, we uh, propose that what we need is more scientific evidence because and we don't need political discussions. And one of the questions that you aligned when you got started was how we could solve the problem in the understanding between different countries. Yes, my idea, main idea is to keep away as more as we can politicians particularly if they are thinking like some of the very important countries in this world, that they have created a terrible atmosphere for the understanding of the people. So these things have to be handled between expert scientists, of course, epidemiologists, molecular biologists, and so on, and, and medical doctors that work in hospitals, and they have key information. So in, with that, I am answering your your first question, that this is a, an issue for scientists and for medical doctors, essentially. It's not good to introduce politicians because they cannot understand many things as it, it has already been said. Uh, when, as, as I will just comment on a few examples. The examination of the locations of early cases 
show that most were located around the Huanan market, which is located to the north of Jansen River. These districts were also the first to exhibit excess pneumonia deaths in January 2020. There is, but there is no epidemiological link to any of the other locally, locality in Wuhan, including the BSL-4 campus of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is located to the south of the Janssen River. So when in the original days, you could see how the epidemic was expanding the south of Wuhan. Wuhan, as you know, is a city with more than 14 million people. And is in Wuhan is far away from the, the area. The, 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 no, the, the Institute of Virology of Wuhan is far away from the area, the central area in the city of Wuhan, because the virus appears at the north, whereas the Institute of Virology is in the south of the Janssen River. So it's clearly shown in this paper by Edward Holmes and other scientists, which are from different countries. Edward Holmes is from Australia, far away from many other places. Viruses closely related to SARS coronavirus have been documented in bats and pangolins in multiple localities in Southeast Asia, including China, Thailand, Cambodia, and Japan. So it is not surprising that a new virus has appeared, a new coronavirus has appeared. As I said before, I am a coronavirologist for the last 35 years, and I have seen the emergency of many coronaviruses, many animal and human coronaviruses. Human coronaviruses are known at least nine. They have isolated seven, but are known nine. The first four, they are already attenuated. And the last three, the, the one that appeared in, in China in year 2002, SARS-1, the one that appeared in Southeast, in, in the Middle East, uh, MERS coronavirus in 2012, and the, the last one that appeared in China in, 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 in 2019. So I am used to see many new coronaviruses emerging constantly. In the last 10 years, in the animal world, we have more than 10 novel coronaviruses. So this is an easy thing that is constantly happening. The emergency of an animal coronavirus takes only three more years. In, as I said, in the last 10 years, we knew about 10 new animal coronaviruses. And uh, although some people, they want to claim that in the lab, the Cheng Li Shi could be the origin for, for this virus, I don't think this is true. Because in, in her laboratory, the only virus that has a 96% ident sequence identity, uh, although you may think that this is a big identity with the present virus. Genetically speaking, this is the same distance that is between the genome of the pigs and the genomes of the human. People like Mr. Trump, that was not an expert in, in genetics, he thought that that was fantastic, that will accuse the lab of Cheng Li Chi, uh, uh, Cheng Li Chi as the origin but he, he's not a geneticist. He didn't realize that the, this distance, four, five percent in genoma, genome identity is the same that we have from men to pigs. So they, this is not an argument. And so and so that is constantly repeated. So if, if since I will have no time to go into detail, please, when you have a few free minutes, if you have not done so, take a look to the manuscript by Dr. Holmes. He clearly states that despite extensive contact tracing on deadly cases during COVID-19 pandemic, there have been no reported cases related to any laboratory staff at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and all staff in the laboratory of Dr. Shi Shengli 
were reported to be zero negative for the virus when they were tested in March 2020. Another statement on the paper is there is no rational experimental reason why a new genetic system will be developed using a, an unknown and unpublished virus with no evidence nor mention of a SARS coronavirus like virus in any prior publication study from the Wuhan Institute of, of Virology. There have been very interesting things in the virus. The virus got a, a new sequence a, made of four amino acids that was integrated in the spike protein. That was terrible because the, this small peptide provided to the virus a cleavage site by one enzyme that is present in any tissue in our body. So that has allowed this virus to infect more than 50 different tissues in our bodies. And people were surprised where was coming this here in Clenwich I, I have no time to go into detail, but just let me know the, the theory in Clevisi, not exactly the same, but similar one, is in very well known of coronaviruses, starting from the mouse hepatitis virus and followed by other human coronaviruses, Hong Kong University virus and OC43 virus. So the origin of this terrible little peptide that expand the tropism of the virus to any organ of our body, causing more than 50 different pathologies. The peptide that was helping to that was already present in very well-known yeah. viruses. So with so little relevance like the mouse hepatitis virus, not all of them, but many of them, they carry this little place, but the little peptide. What I am trying to say at the end is that through recombination, through evolution, the, any virus from bats that was closely related to the actual SARS coronavirus 2 could have recombined with these other human coronaviruses. I, I know that at least four human coronaviruses infect, let's say, 95% of the human population. We all have these viruses that are causing to us the winter common cold. So if some one person is infected with an original virus in the Wuhan area and recombined with a human coronavirus that was fully attenuated, causing just the winter common cold, eh, that will be the simple explanation for the appearance of this virus. Like it has been happening in the previous years for the emergency of all the other coronaviruses. Yes. So in conclusion, mm -hmm. I will read two sentences. As for the vast majority of human viruses, the most direct explanation for the origin of SARS coronavirus 2 is a sonotic event, in my opinion, and also from that of other excellent scientists. In this uh, Edward Holmes paper, is co signed by, by Susan Weiss. He's a well known coronavirology for many years. Mm -hmm. I, I know her. For, yeah. for Peter Durthy, it's a Nobel Prize, up to 22 scientists. So yeah. I think it has a good base. And there is, in, there is currently no evidence that SARS coronavirus 2 has a laboratory origin. There is no evidence that any earlier, early cases had any connection to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. In contrast, to the clear epidemiology, there are clear epidemiological links to animal markets in Wuhan, but there is no evidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology possessed or worked on a progenitor of SARS coronavirus 2 prior to the epidemic. I believe that there is substantial scientific evidence supporting a zoonotic origin for SARS coronavirus 2. This is not Wuhan, it's a statement that is 99% true, in my opinion. I cannot say 100%. But while the possibility of a laboratory accident cannot be entirely diminished, dissemination system is highly unlikely relative to the repeated human-animal contacts that occur routinely in the wildlife. And I think I better stop here and maybe later on we can talk more.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Juanes. Very clearly, so you believe that it's most likely the SARS-CoV-2 or, uh, yeah, SARS-CoV-2 has a zoonotic origin and highly unlikely that, and no evidence so far that it came from a lab leak. Um, uh, finally, last but not least, Professor Wu Zhuwei from Nanjing University Public Health Research Center of China. He graduated from Nanjing University and received his uh, PhD from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. He was trained as a postdoc fellow in viral immu immuno immunology in New York University and worked as a faculty at Population Council in Rockefeller University and then in the University of Pennsylvania until 2006. Then he relocated to China and founded the Center for Public Health Research at Nanjing University and has served as director of the center since. He's also associate director of the State Key Laboratory of Analytical Chemistry for Life Sciences an adjunct associate professor at New York University and associate in Southampton Statistical Sciences Research Institute, University of Southampton in the UK. His main research interest is uh, uh, RNA viral infection, host immune response and viral escape mechanisms, B cell immunology and therapeutical antibody and vaccines, particularly single domain antibody technology. He has also served as director for mega project for key infectious diseases under the Ministry of Health of China since 2008. And he uh, also serves in the steering committee of multipurpose prevention technologies initiated by Kami, USAID, NIH, and as a member in the guideline development group for SRHR at WHO. Uh, Professor Wu Zhiwei, the floor is yours, please. Well, thank you for having me here. Um, yeah, the, the previous few uh, speakers had give uh, excellent presentations. Uh, I'm really you know, um, impressed by some of the studies, in particular Professor Foster's study basically showing how the uh, virus uh, muted and the, the, the various different subtypes appeared in uh, during the uh, last year's pandemic. Uh, it's a very interesting. That actually gave me an uh, impression, uh, you know, it's, um, it, it's quite clear that, you know, the the, the origin of the virus could be rather complex and we need to look at it more uh, in a broader scope and to see how this actually happened and then move forward. The, the, if you look at the, the, um, the bat cave in Yunnan province, uh, uh, Professor Foster mentions that there are a few people uh, basically they carry the antibodies. Uh, I think it's a very interesting um, very interesting uh, uh, information. The, the thing is that, you know, we do have a lot of uh, the RNA uh, sequence data. Uh, uh, if you think about how the virus travel from human to human, I think we also need to look at the, uh, the antibody and immune response as well. We know that for a lot of viruses, they induce a very distinct serological response. So serotyping and the genotyping actually are the two very uh, powerful tools uh, trying to look at the relationship of the virus transmission and how the, the, actually the immune system put the pressure to drive the virus to mutate. So those are the things that actually I think in the long run, it's a something we need to look more carefully, more thoroughly in the scientific manner instead of you know, just based on few uh, examples of jump jump into a, a, a conclusion. So this is something actually, I think as a scientist we need to do, and we need to conduct a, a more uh, a thorough studies. The thing, uh, what, what, what I want to you know, point out is that I think uh, the finding the virus origin is uh, apparently very uh, important, but this probably is not the most urgent issue right now. Um, as uh, yeah, humanity experienced uh, many different uh, pandemics, uh, epidemics, and we, we, we have been looking for origins of various different pathogens. It's, uh, it's very clear that uh, very few pathogens we know where they came from, how they were transmitted to humans. So this is a very time consuming uh, process. We need to put on a lot of effort trying to uh, find it out. Um, as uh, uh, Professor Foster mentioned, I, I think one uh, issue which is uh, very interesting to me is that you know uh, when uh, the uh, conspiracy theorists uh, saying that uh, this actually leads from the uh, Wuhan lab or uh, the Wuhan personnel uh, became infected by the bad 
by bad coronavirus, and that's called uh, it, it, the pandemic started from there. But, but I think it's uh, it's totally unlikely if you if you look at the the contagious property of this virus. If indeed there were Wuhan uh, personnel uh, were infected first, I would expect that the you know, people in Wuhan Institute would become became a, a, a first class of infected individuals instead of in the seafood market, isn't it? That's what uh, we, we learned from two years circulation of this virus. So, uh, in the time when the uh, pandemic started, we had uh, no knowledge. People unlikely took any precaution or, or social distancing or, or quarantine measures to prevent. Then you, you would definitely expect, you know, you, not only dozens, even hundreds of people around the Wuhan or the Wuhan Institute would, would become in, uh, infected. I don't know whether you've been ever been in Wuhan Institute. It's a, a very crowded, a packed institute. A lot of people working in a relatively small environment. So um, this actually from uh, uh, Dr. Professor Foster data. I mean, I'm pretty convinced. You know, this is not something happening in Wuhan or started in Wuhan. It likely started from somewhere else. I, I think that you know the sequence data and the subtype of dissemination data providing a very powerful argument. Uh, you know, this is something we need to look at in a broader scope uh, for the various different uh, possible origins. The other thing is uh, uh, Professor Ding and other uh, speakers also mentioned that, that this virus has been detected in various different locations in different countries and different populations and different uh, sources like sewage and water uh, uh, draining systems. I think this uh, gives us the uh, very clear information that this uh, the origin uh, could be much more complicated uh, than we thought. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not uncommon that the virus could uh, uh, could have started from multiple origins, uh, particularly when you think about the coronavirus as a, such a broad uh, mammalian host. So it's uh, it's I wouldn't be surprised if in the future that people find that, okay this virus actually is hosted in various different uh, mammalian animals and jump from multiple sites. So uh, if you read the recent report. Uh, in the Northeast US uh, that they want tail deer that we are tested uh, uh, serologically positive for coronavirus. So this is something actually, I think it's very interesting, although for the studies should be done, but this is, uh, uh, this would give us uh, um, uh, an idea that the coronavirus uh, distribution is, uh, spatially is, it, it should be much broader than we thought. So. Um, I think that this is something actually we all should bear in mind. But one of the issues actually I'm as a scientist really concerned is that this uh, origin funding uh, mission has been uh, really poisoned by the uh, political uh, involvement. Uh, you know, in the past we know that uh, the funding the origin uh, pretty much the scientist's job. And it's not driven by a single entity or the government or any you know, organizations, not even NGOs. When the, when the epidemic happens and people automatically will be trying to find out where the virus came from, how this is started. And you would see that the multiple scientists from various different countries were trying to do research. This is, I think, the, the right form of doing the, uh, the research finding the origin and uh, all, you know, I mean, only one, uh, only the studies or the conclusion coming from this source, uh, peer reviewed, uh, they, they have a convincing power to make people that, uh, take actions to prevent the further happening of the pandemic. I think the current uh, environment is very toxic. Uh, the issue was raised by some US politicians and uh, driven by some media reports and all sorts of, you know, uh, all sorts of theories, uh, conspiracies, uh, lies, and you, you can't really tell what is truth, what is, uh, what is uh, false. It's uh, very complex right now. So I think in this environment, uh, it's very hard for scientists to do any, any, any convincing work. And it's, uh, that's one of the problem. Uh, if you look at the WHO's team coming to Wuhan, conducted the research, and they give us a very clear indications that, okay, um, the lab leaking theory is extremely unlikely. And then now the uh, a number of politicians 
uh, still driving this theory and uh, trying to um, trying to have another investigation. I, I think this is uh, something actually, uh, you know, uh, to me, my feeling is that whatever uh, you found, uh, then they're always open to 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 uh, suspicion uh, under this kind of environment because my feeling is the first uh, uh, studies um, were not satisfied uh, by the U.S. government or some politicians. Basically, the the report that they not provide what they, they they like. I think that's the whole issue. Uh, it's um, you know for the second study or research, there is no. Um, no new uh, evidence or no new, uh, you know, rationale why we need the second uh, investigations or research. Um, it, when you are looking at the uh, possibilities, most of the scientific communities would believe that the lab leaking or the lab personnel infection and disseminated from that is extremely unlikely. So basically, the, the natural origin is a more likely scenario. Uh, so my question basically is very simple. So if if the lab uh, related uh, dissemination is an extremely unlikely, un, unlikely event, so why we need to stick with uh, uh, trying to find out the uh, focus on the very unlikely source instead of going for the more likely source, which actually more likely give you a, 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 a reliable uh, uh, or convincing outcome and we could take some action to prevent further uh, other break of the disease. I think this is something actually we need to look at the cost and the benefit issues. So this is uh, um, um, my uh, point. The other thing is that I think, you know, my feeling is that the WHO probably is not a, a very proper uh, entity to conduct this study because in the past, uh, you, in the past that most of this uh, virus origin tracing is done by individual scientists. They get grants, they conduct the studies, and they, 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 they draw various different conclusions. And when you have, have all those come together, people build up consensus. So this is a more scientific manner of doing this kind of uh, research. So um, uh, since the time is uh, running short, I, I would like to propose that um, I, I think it's a more... Uh, uh, more adequate way of doing this is that let's you know create some uh, some kind of a research program. Let's the scientists do the research, individual scientists, just as we do the research uh, in uh, other uh, uh, regular research and the, uh, from the evolutionary biologists, uh, from the uh, epidemiologists, and uh, also the public health expert from various different angles and looking at the human uh, factor, looking at the uh, you know. Uh, wild animals and uh, natural factors, you know, all sorts of and the clinical uh, uh, doctors uh, also could be involved. I mean, from all multiple phases of studies, then we come down to a uh, certain consensus conclusion that I think would be much more uh, convincing and acceptable to people. So uh, this is pretty much uh, uh, my point, uh, Yuxing. Thank you. Back to you then. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Professor Wu. I know um, a lot of points uh, everybody wants to make, but time is really limited, and we have already gone um, gone on for one hour and fifty minutes. But it has been indeed fascinating and very uh, original and um, uh, important suggestions having been made here. So we're going to go into a second round to give everybody the opportunity to react to what others have said, or to uh, supplement or whatever they think they feel is necessary. Um, let's let's try to limit the time of that. Um, everybody will be given five minutes to react to whatever whichever panelist you feel you most want to talk about, react to, and altogether let's keep that into something like thirty five minutes, and then I'll open the floor of uh, if there are any questions from the audience or any additional points anybody here would, would want to make. And let me start with uh, uh, academician Wu Chong Yi here. Please go ahead, Professor Wu. Yeah, thank you. I, I can see sort of a sense broad agreement. And so I have actually a specific- Five minutes, point. please, each, everybody. Thank you. Sure, sure. So several panel, panel members uh, spoke about WHO's uh, uh, task, uh, uh, responsibility. So. The many, many teams are, uh, a research team are embarked on the search of the origin. And so what is really missing, and I keep pushing this point, there is no conceptual development. 
everybody talk about empirical ways of oh, you know, look this and look at that and use this machine and so on. But people should start thinking about the process of adaptation. For example, it, so I think it behooves WHO to develop a concept. For example, if you come to a place, wherever, whichever place, and look for the, the, the viral origin, you have to, to define how many mutations do you think uh, uh, make the vi virus uh, 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 make the jump from say bats to human? And, and if it's a multiple mutation process, where did it happen? It, under what, of con what kind of conditions? So I keep asking WHO to come up with the model. If you come to a place, whichever place it is, you are looking for a crime suspect. You have to define some broad outline what you're looking for. You're looking for tall guy, short guy, the, the, the bold guy, or whatever. Uh, and the virus, what might be the feature of the virus? How many mutations you think would, would, would if, uh, make the jump? But we emphasize so much on empirical side of it. And, and the, the conceptual aspect is blank. Nobody say what we are looking for. Everybody say how we want to look for, how many members and what kind of lab notebook they want to look at. What, what if the virus is actually sitting in front of you? Do you have an idea that that's a virus I'm looking for? No, because we haven't think about it, thought about it. So let me just say one more thing, last thing. Please, WHO, please come up with the model. Every team is looking for it and you are representing international effort. Use some brain propose some concept, what you are looking for. So that's, that's what I, I'm, I'm asking very specifically. So under the current framework, actually you should be asking this to the WHO and China probably because this is a joint study. So it's uh, probably not just the WHO that should be coming up with this uh, model. And even according to um, Professor Wu Zhiwei, it shouldn't really be the job of the WHO to look in for, to, to, to be undertaking this task. Well, I think they are, every team in every country, everybody's looking for it. And WHO is ostensibly the only one that represent international effort. So they should be the one, the glue, uh, hold everybody together. And that's the concept, not the technical detail. All right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Academician Wu. Next, uh, let me go to Professor Shui Feng, your five minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, it's great to hear different voices, and uh, uh, and especially I would like to thank Luis because in fact uh, we mentioned uh, the same papers, the, the professor Eddie Holmes, and uh, yeah, uh, th this paper is under review and sale, so, and uh, he has provided a lot of evidence supporting the uh, zoonotic. Or origin of such coronavirus too. So, so yeah, uh, I'm sure uh, it will be published and uh, it's worth reading. And uh, also, Luis uh, has said a lot about. Uh, so uh, he 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 is quite honest. That he cannot he he don't have the facilities and the, uh, capacities to engineer such a virus. Near uh, Professor Zheng Li Shi. Yeah. Uh, so th this is uh, uh, what uh, we want to share. So uh, so th this actually responded to um, Jonathan. Jonathan, in his presentation, he mentioned the gain of function studies. In, in fact, so no scientists can do this now because so. My question is, where is the starting point to do this experiment? Where is the genetic bone, the genetic bone for this study? So we, we don't have any information uh, to do this experiment before the pandemic. So no one can do such kind of function studies. This is my, my, my view. So the first and last point, uh, for the last point, I would like to highlight that it, it is the scientists should do uh, 
uh, the origin studies rather than you know spies. So 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 I don't think we should wait for the USA so uh, to 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 uh, to release a, another report for this because. I don't believe spies. As a scientist, I just believe in evidence, real scientific evidence. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shi. Um, you said you only believe in scientists, but not spies. And I would second that opinion. Um, I think the gain of function point, probably Jonathan would like to react uh, later when, when your turn comes, if you will. And other uh, panelists, of course, if you are, if you, the need to comment on that, you can also do that. Uh, next five minutes will be given to Professor Peter Foster, please. Uh, thank you, I'll try to keep it very short. Um, so what I see emerging here, both from uh, uh, Jonathan's, um, uh, comments and Professor Wu Jiwei's um, comments, and thank you very much for the praise, and as well as uh, other our other Chinese hosts, is that perhaps some bureaucracies are too slow as they are at the moment to react to something as big as uh, the coronavirus pandemic, and perhaps we need indeed new platforms where uh, at very quick notice individual researchers with special skills can be activated at short notice, and, and therefore that's something I think uh, I would very much support as an idea. Okay, yeah. And then, uh, but I want to say briefly one thing on the home mm -hmm. study. I yeah. found a, a lot of homework was in there, excuse the pun, um, but I thought also that they were too narrowly focused on Wuhan as an origin. So even though they looked at the wet market specifically, um, as I showed in my presentation, I'm I'm, I'm not even convinced that the Wuhan area or Hubei province is the best candidate at the moment, but clearly the data at, is, is uh, limiting for these very early stages and, and uh, that's not the last word. But I think we shouldn't narrow on a Hubei province origin just yet. Okay, thank you, Professor Foster. Um, Jonathan, your time to react to some of the points that have been raised so far. Okay, I must make it clear that I do not agree with gain of function experiment or gain of function suggestions. I think they're extremely, extremely unlikely. The problem is once the suggestion has been made, you have to have a way of disproving it. And it's very hard to disprove. Now, I agree totally that we are probably not capable of designing such an experiment in order to make a virus that we currently have. And I would have argued that if I had had more time. So I don't think the gain of function experiments are something that I, I believe in, but some people do. So the, how do you, and some of those people are influential. So how do you address the problem that the, the problem has been, you know, the cat's been left out of the, we have the idea out there. How do we get rid of it? And it's difficult. And that's why I would like to see people formulating more specific hypotheses it, which would be testable. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that we have to be very careful about the way we assess some of the um, sewage data. As far as I know, and I think, I, I, I think I'm right, the first report came from Spain, and that was in March or so. And that talked about data based on one out of three PCR probes. And there was no sequence data. So I cannot consider that reliable. The second report was the Italian one, but that was from samples taken in late December, 2019. The third one was a French one, and that samples taken uh, in March, 2020. So I don't think it's, it's, one can conclude from these studies that there was virus floating around in Europe at that particular time. And I think, the general point would be is that we have to be very careful to look at the data that is presented before we draw conclusions from it. And I'm slightly worried that people haven't been looking at the data hard enough. Mm, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I think there are more papers that have been published that actually point to earlier emergence of well, uh, the progenitor. Well, I mean, I would like to know where they are. 
Yeah, I yeah, mean, I just Googled them. I can't for, find. For very, no, for instance, the very uh, the latest that I know is the preprints with the Lancet, which po was posted on uh, early August, which says that researchers in Italy estimates that SARS-CoV-2... At what date? What date? Yeah. Were the samples taken? Yeah, uh, the 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 the, the uh, conclusion is that they estimate SARS-CoV-2 progenitor known human infections to have emerged in late June and late August 2019 in Lombardy, northern Italy. Uh, if anybody's interested, it is open source. People can go and find. But I think the researchers will definitely not make this kind of estimates based only on very few number isolated weak evidence uh, in your words and they have a way to find to to say whether the date of the collection of the samples can actually point to that kind of preliminary conclusion but anyway just to just to uh, you know allude to the fact that there are studies which are pointing to a, a even earlier date of this virus emerging in europe mid mid june and mid or oh, and late august late june and late august 2019 so that's a very important uh, aspect in the whole thing anyway it's 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 not for me to <laughs> to be arguing you here i should really leave it up to the scientists can i jump um, in and say one thing uh, um professor Wu, professor Wu, just a moment let's finish the second round first and then you know what i'll open up for real fast uh if anybody still has some something burning to say just to be fair to everybody how about that um mm -hmm. yeah sorry professor Wu. let me go to eric ding your five minutes please Yes, I thank you. This is a very interesting debate, and I'm really glad you guys ordered, organized it. I think, first of all, that um, it's not just a wastewater. Um, there is the there's the in Turin um, or near Milan, Italy. There was a child who was diagnosed with uh, COVID from his blood samples. Uh, he got sick end of October and was positive in early November, and the CDC blood sample study was um, published in Clinical Infectious Diseases and it was actually uh, dated prior to November. I think it was, uh, I think October, September was the, the date in which they had found the archived blood samples with the positive results. So, so those are not false readings so whatsoever. Um, and so in terms of gain of function, you know, I, I also work in policy and you know, one thing is policy is oftentimes driven by optics. Optics, not the physics optics, but the optics of what people perceive, because a lot of this discussion, we're all scientists, but what people see is that if scientists argue amongst each other, and this is how also climate change is denied, because, oh, the scientists can't agree, you know, we're not going to touch all this kind of stuff. The thing is, when people see scientists arguing about this, they, it, it fuels actually that they feel there's a conspiracy that because the scientists cannot agree. So when we kind of disagree with each other, we have to disagree in a nuanced way. And, and for the lay public, they need to hear, oh, we agree on this, but it's just these minor details that we disagree on. Because if the scientists attack each other uh, in, in obviously in a more public forum than this, the lay public will see that this is a, oh my God, science cannot agree on anything. Maybe some of the conspiracy theories are true. I just want to warn that from a policy aspect, those kind of optics really drive also conspiracy theories. So we have to really, in the public forums, um, disagree carefully uh, about this, uh, about the nuances. And I think that's part of the thing. Um, you know, dry, this messaging, you know, this, um, you know, gain of function, you know, what is gain of function? Some people can agree on gain of function because the argument between Fauci and Senator Rand Paul was about you know, you don't know what gain of function is, right? That's, you don't know what you're talking about. I think, first of all, that these kind of issues have to be, re we have to have scientific consensus and debunk when, whenever things cross the line on political things, but also be mindful about the policy optics. How you discuss it in a scientific private forum versus how you discuss it on a you know, Twitter or a news media outlet. And I think that will help drive, go long ways in helping resolve this in a, a way that actually that people can trust and people don't immediately go to conspiracy theories whenever they hear vehement disagreement. And that's my two cents.
Okay, thank you so much. Indeed, it's very difficult for a lot of people to follow the topic. I mean, I have been doing this subject for so long and reading so much to be able to follow, right? But otherwise, for the ordinary people, it's very, very difficult. And, and conspiracy has one thing about it. It's easy and it's, you know, thrilling. It's easy to understand and uh, entertaining sometimes as well. Anyway, many thanks to Eric. Uh, next, Professor M. Juanes, your five minutes, please. Well, I don't know. Uh, let's see if, whether I can make three points. The first one, I will start with the Chinese government. I think Chinese government has the power to organize by themselves a committee of experts that could investigate the data in China and communicate first the results to the Chinese government. I think they have the right to do that. There are options, but I think it's important to share the information the Chinese government, and they can choose the players for this in the world, not only with Chinese, but with other people. And this, this has to be so. Then if I reply to, to uh, Hu Chung from Chicago University, what you are asking for is almost impossible because viruses, they can make thousands, possibly millions, they can follow millions of mechanisms to change virulence, to go from non-infected crossing species, just with that can take the mutation of a single amino acid on the receptor binding site, but that can be a matter of the polymerase that contains 16 different genes. So, there is no model, a single model. There are thousands. Viruses are very powerful. They generate billions and billions and billions of mutants. There are no two RNA viruses that have the same genome. There are always at least one difference between one genome and the other. So they have so many possibilities that it's impossible to present a unique uh, model. And gain of function. Gain of function. Uh, I am, we are in our lab, we do lots of function every day because we delete genes completely or partially to attenuate the virus and make vaccines. This is our job these days. We can attenuate viruses because we will not be taken to the jail if we do that. But if we do a gain of function, they will take us to the jail, okay, immediately because this is absolutely forbidden. Again, there are thousands of ways you can do that. A single change, a single mutation on the E protein, envelope protein that destroy, uh, destroys ion channel activity will kill the virus. And you can restore that by a compensatory mutation. So this is again a highly complex matter, but you cannot work on this. You can work in one direction, attenuation. This is fantastic because it's, this is the modern way to develop vaccines but not in, in the gain of function. You can do that, you better don't do that in Europe or in the United States because you will go to the jail next day, okay? So uh, I better stop here because. Thank you very much, uh, Professor M. Juanes. And uh, Professor Uji Wei, please. Um, I think, you know, finding uh, the virus origin is more like an, uh, detective in a forensic analysis. And you start with uh, many different possibilities, trying to broaden your scope and to see what actually are likely or probably. Uh, I, I think you know, this is the right way to do is that you need to broaden uh, uh, scope and looking for different possibilities. And gradually based on evidence, you narrow down to two probabilities and then focus your effort and your resources on those highly possible or probable events. I think this is something actually we're missing in the early stage of this virus origin finding. Uh, I think a part of the reason is that a, a, a few politicians are trying to steal the entire uh, narratives. And so the scientists are pretty much on the sideline of the whole uh, scenario in finding the, the virus origin. So this is something actually if we are serious uh, trying to find where the virus came from, how it evolved and getting into human and disseminated, we need to do in a scientific manner, that's the uh, one point. The other thing is that for the WHO's role, I think it's better as Professor Wu mentioned in the uh, 
in, in, in the uh, speech that um, WHO could set certain parameters and uh, concept and what we actually need to find and then leave all the rest of the job, the detailed analysis, tracing, evolutionary uh, uh, study and the sequence, all sorts of technical issues leave to the scientists, the individual scientists, let them do the job and then come uh, with a consensus. This is something actually science could do the best and not politicians. Uh, not a uh, you know a senators a president so this is I think uh, what, uh, what we need to do in the future virus uh, uh, origin tracing. The other is that uh, you know sometimes as uh, uh, Professor Stone mentions uh, about the gain of a function, it's um, I think you know technically it's very hard to disprove this because it's like you know uh, the the. Uh, some of the uh, politicians are saying, okay, during, uh, the, uh, during the late uh, September, uh, people, uh, three people in, in Wuhan, instead of a virology, became sick. And then they, they, they didn't provide the name of who actually became sick and uh, for, for what the reason and where well, they hospitalized. And they, if they refuse to provide the information, then you can't prove it because, because you have, if you if you do not have such a patient, then how, how can how can you prove that you don't have it? So this is more like a kind of a trap, okay? So I think this is something actually we should avoid in terms of you know this uh, this virus origin uh, uh, finding. This is uh, as a scientist, I think we all should bear in mind that the politician politics should not step into this um, this kind of issue. Otherwise, then. Uh, the international collaborative, collaborative speed and the spirit of the science will break down. So uh, this is my, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Wu. Uh, I, I probably see there are still people who want to follow up and uh, react. How about this? Um, I'm going to give another 10 minutes for uh, a free, for free you know intervention if anybody feel like doing it and make it really fast and efficient i see professor wu already raising your hand okay anybody else who wants to make a point please make a sign and i'll go to you next professor wu chongyi please try to make it short okay i'll uh, uh, try to address the issue of professor imbalance say that i i i sort of don't quite agree i think in science we always need a model and hypothesis we always know that our models are, are, are wrong, but without a model, without hypothesis, uh, we cannot progress. And, and I don't think virus is more complex than Drosophila, which I work on, or human or plants. So I think the viral a model to guide our thinking and approach is absolutely necessary. But my original point is, is was raised in, in the context of, of uh, papers about uh, uh, early origin. And I, I think this Lancet uh, paper, it's, it's actually a Lancet archive, uh, is absolutely interesting that I urge everybody to read it. If it's correct as they claim, everything we discussed today will be totally changed, trust me. That I read the paper very, very carefully. The, the group had published another paper. Uh, they, it's not that they, they, they identify the sequences. The sequences actually have the three correct mutations and that make it very believable. So please read this paper from the researcher at University of Milan. That's all I want to say here. So you were talking about the uh, preprints with the Lancet. Right, the, the paper you mentioned. Okay, uh, we would wait for the official publication then. Okay, Jonathan, your time. I agree, absolutely. It would be nice to keep the politicians out of things, but how do you do that? As scientists, <laughs> yes, it would be great if we could do things as scientists. How do Not you so keep easy. the scientists, uh, politicians out? This is a terrible question, okay? Yeah, and this Too seems good. to be a point where everybody agrees. <laughs> okay, so that's that was your intervention. Okay, anybody else who want to say something? Yes, uh, Professor Foster, just go ahead. Yes, well, um, first of all, I just wanted to offer some common ground between what you said, our host, and... Uh, Professor Jonathan Stoy on, on the Italian study. I, I looked at the Italian uh, uh, immunological study and I, I agree that the baseline there doesn't look as if it's conclusive to me. But on the other hand, I do agree that if you just calculate using the mutation rate, 
when uh, the epidemic started, then you do get dates which are autumn. So that, that is on your side. So I hope that's common ground so we don't argue amongst each other like, like yeah. Eric was warning us against. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, I think uh, there's no point saying politicians aren't allowed to comment or uneducated people aren't allowed to comment. I think uh, as scientists, we need to provide a plausible, well-founded solution, and then all these counter arguments will dissipate naturally. So I think we shouldn't focus on criticizing politicians or telling them not to comment. I think we should focus on getting our story well-founded and correct, and then all the other problems are solved. Absolutely, I agree with you. And I think, you know, this whole discussion has been a breathe of fresh air for me, just to hear people who know what they're talking about talk about this. Um, any, any other uh, comments, any other intervention and somebody would like to make about this? Um, okay, if not, um, Shicheng, do we have any questions? Shall, shall I open the floor for any possible Q&A? I do see a comment here, but it's not really, it seems like a rhetorical question instead of a, a real question about science. Do we have anybody in uh, who are listening to this who would like to ask a question to any of our panelists? If so, please do that now. Yeah. If not, um, since this is the only comment I have gotten, so I think I should I should read it to you know read it to be fair uh, by uh, this person called Fernando Munoz. He said, when WHO asks for a second investigation into Wuhan, it negates the first investigation and places a question mark on the competence and honorability of the whole WHO team. However, if WHO was compromised, why should China accept a second investigation and why even ask for an investigation into Fort Detrick? But if WHO was not compromised, why should we need a second Wuhan investigation? This all points at this question, who would benefit from muddying the waters? Um, if anybody would like to comment on that. Okay, Jonathan, you have a hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the WHO investigation was always supposed to have more than one phase. So to say that it's a new questioning phase is, is probably incorrect. But it is interesting, and I would like to ask my, uh, have my questions asked here, because the WHO does seem to have uh, at least gone back to what they have said in the first report, you know, I mean, the first report, the, the phase one report says, you know, the lab leak is uh, extremely unlikely. And the WHO's recent statement says people should build on the recommendations of phase one report, but then it says all options, you know, uh, or another, another investigation should be focused on the lab. So it seems that the WHO is also contradicting itself here. As well, I don't know if everybody is uh, is following me. Okay, Professor Wu. Yeah, yeah I agree with uh, uh, Professor Stoig. Uh, point is that the WHO's uh, uh, investigation could be multi-phased, uh, but the issue is that if the uh, first investigation uh, has the conclusions that it's extremely unlikely, then there is a. Uh, 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 and the issue here, why you need to come back and uh, to look at this, uh, and the issue, which is already concluded as most uh, extremely unlikely. And there are many other possibilities which are actually urgently need to be addressed. So uh, this is something actually, uh, as I mentioned, that we are, uh, we are in the heart of a pandemic. We need to focus on the more, most uh, urgent issue trying to you know, stop the virus from spreading and the people are dying. Uh, you, we, we, we shouldn't just uh, uh, address very few politicians' concern. I mean, I fully agree with Professor Foster's point that we need to talk to them, uh, communicate with politicians. Uh, 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 what, what I mean is that I, I, I don't mean that, you know, uh, we are getting away uh, from the politicians staying in the ivory tower. The, the issue is that for scientific research, we need to have our own agenda. We need to stick to our own methodology and the concept instead of, you know, we are steered by the politicians. So that's something actually uh, I'm, I'm actually criticizing about it. So um, it's the same as the WHO's research into the origin of the virus. Then we need to, from the scientific 
perspectives we need to look at in the broader possibilities. Okay, Jonathan, I saw I saw you had a hand up, but then you took it down. Doesn't mean that you don't want to. <laughs> you have no point to make. Okay, uh, Professor Wu. However, I saw you had one up, but uh, it disappeared as well. Well, I'll, I'll ask quickly, and I say that everybody want the whole matter to be done more scientifically and more scientific thinking. And I've been watching WHO, I find all the statement insufficiently uh, scientific. It's really more administrative, political than scientific. That's why I keep pushing them to do what scientists okay. do rather than politicians okay, do. Okay, I got your point. Okay, we do have a question here. And Professor Ujiwei, you still have that hand sign up if you don't oh, want let to... me Let me put it on, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, we, we have this one question and uh, I would like to give it an opportunity by this person called Stephen K. How do you explain the finding of no viruses in 80,000 animals, the finding of no seroconversion in 9,950 pre-epidemic slesimans, and the failure of finding posterior diversity in the virus genome? All of these are consistent with a lab origin. So for the scientists who are... Okay, uh, Professor Shi, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm I'm glad to answer this question because I have been uh, sampling a lot of uh, wild animals and uh, have I identified uh, some uh, uh, coronavirus to related coronaviruses from these wild animals. We also performed a, a simulation uh, study and uh, we found to for bats, uh, especially uh, how house shoe bats, they are distributed uh, across a wild uh, geographic range uh, in most uh, parts of Asia. You, you can find uh, uh, such bat species. So for, uh, for the 20, uh, 80, for the 80,000 animals mentioned in the WHO report, I think it's just uh, you know, it's just a, a very small number of the samples. All, also, all the uh, animals, all the samples were collected from China. Uh, so if you expand this uh, uh, sampling, sampling efforts to other countries, to a, a, a much broader uh, geographical range, I think you will find uh, even a PCR positive or antibody positive samples, it's quite easy because uh, such a virus, such, uh, uh, such two related virus are just there. That's all, thank you. Okay, Professor Shi, thank you very much. Um, I still see a comment which talks about, you know, if you can't rule out the, li the lab hypothesis, um, why, why don't we overrule? the lab hypothesis by conducting a lab audit. Um, I think various panelists have already touched upon that, but in conclusion, does anybody still want to follow up and make a, make a, you know, one more comment on that? Or it's pretty much already clear. I think people already answered that question as well. I th you know, probably as uh, Professor Wu mentioned, how can you prove that you don't have something when you don't have it? <laughs> and again, to which point can you prove that you don't have it? So, and, and I think that is not a scientific matter anymore. Uh, of course, that's just my opinion. Thank you so much to all the panelists. We have uh, really gone on and on quite much longer than the original time schedule, but it has indeed been very interesting. I think by and large, uh, to, to come back to Eric's point about you know, the optics, I think the great majority of the scientists here do agree that it, it most likely come from a zoonotic source, right? I mean, I don't think there is a, a huge, huge uh, disagreement there, um, but that's, Again, my contraction from, from this discussion. If there is no clear objection, Shi Cheng, it is back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lu Xing, for your wonderful uh, moderation. And thanks to our scientists for sharing those enlightening uh, opinions in very professional and scientific approach and also for our audiences. I enjoyed this discussion very much and do think that uh, such discussion 
are generally too few. Uh, this fruitful discussion suddenly gave me a new idea to, to summarize. I think all of the actors, we do have some, at least share some consensus. For example, we should rely on scientists to keep away from politicians. Uh, uh, most likely it is uh, rooted from the nature. And also maybe we should, uh, we should uh, establish some new platform to develop uh, uh, international guidelines on, on a written tracing, something like that. I think I will summarize all of the points which we could agree and maybe we, can, we could come up with a statement signed by the scientists so that, that we can really recalibrate the direction of the tracing of the COVID-19 region. Uh, finally, thanks again very much. And for those uh, common views, we are willing to uh, collect them and uh, send you back for all those studies. This is a contribution we can make and I will leave it to future dialogues. Uh, we have already uh, quite beyond the schedule. Uh, thanks, thank you all again and look forward to seeing you in future dialogues. Thank you. Bye.